Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Today we're teaching, we have the lesson, The Fall, and we have Scott and Elisa teaching with us today. Um, before we begin, though, who's the most important part of Sabbath school? Holy Spirit. Elisa, could you lead us in prayer? Absolutely. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us here again this Sabbath day. We thank you for preserving this time that we may have this blessing and, and the, the inspiration and the word um, that we can study. Please be with us as we study. Open our hearts and mind to receive the message you have for us. Help us to um, know how to apply that and then have a willing heart to do so. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, so last week we looked at God's creation. And we saw, and we had a quote from Ellen White that we wrapped it up with from Christ Triumphant, page 8. How beautiful the earth was when it came from the Creator's hand. God presented before the universe a world which even His all-seeing eye could find no spot or stain, no defect or crookedness. Each part of His creation occupied a place assigned it and answered the purpose for which it was created. Like the parts of some great machine, part fitted to part, and all was in perfect harmony. There was no disease, and the vegetable kingdom was without taint or of corruption. God looked upon the work of his hands wrought out by Christ and pronounced it very good. He looked upon a perfect world in which there was no trace of sin, no imperfection. And now we come to lesson two, the fall. <laughs> how did we get here? What happened? We don't even know how long it passed from creation to when Adam and Eve fell. But in chapter three of Genesis, we see the consequences and the hope of that tragic day. The focal point of the whole chapter being Genesis verse, chapter three, verses 14 and 15. We're going to read that now. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise, or other versions say crush, you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, who is the serpent? Well, in verse 1, he's described as crafty, shrewd, or cunning, depending on your version, Bible version. Does that sound like something that was perfect without spot or stain in a sinless world? No. <laughs> So, in case we have any doubts, Revelation 12, 9 says, The great dragon was thrown down, that serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan. This is about as plain as it can be. The certain serpent is Satan. Now, in verse 15, the word enmity means to be hostile towards one. And it's definitely not friends, right? Um, the serpent will strike the heel but the heel will crush his head. And we're going to see in today's lesson just how that will happen someday. We, talk, we hear about the woman's um, seed. We know who the serpent's seed is. That's Satan's seed, or all that follow him, all that have their father as the devil. But who is the woman's seed? It's, it's unique because when the Old Testament was translated to Greek in the Septuagint, there was a phrase that was used called autos. And that pronoun in Greek is not feminine, following the woman, and it's not gender neutral, following a population. It actually is specified as a male individual pointing to the Messiah. So who do you think is the only one who can crush the serpent's head? Jesus, yes. In these two verses, we see the great controversy in action. We see the love and mercy of God. Are Adam and Eve going to die? Yes, they transgressed the law. God made it very plain to them. But do they have hope for something better someday than their predicament of death? Yes, they do. 
and a Savior and Redeemer named Jesus Christ. We look at Genesis chapter 3, and we have what's called a chiastic structure. And hopefully they have this up on the screen. So we can see that verses 14 and 15 are the main point of that chiastic structure. So we're going to start off with, um, and it actually forms kind of a wedge shape like this. And the focal point being verses 14 and 15. So we're going to see on the first part of this structure how man fails to guard or keep the garden and expel the serpent. We see this even in some verse, things that are going to come up later from um, patriarchs and prophets, how Adam felt bad about letting Eve stray from his side when she actually was tempted by the fruit. And we see in verse 23 and 24 how God expels man, stations a guardian or a keeper, the cherubim and the flaming sword. And we'll come back to that later after we finish our chaotic structure. Next, we're going to see in verse 3 where it says, you shall, you, uh, you shall not eat or you shall not die. Right? The serpent promised this. And yet we see in, verses, in, in verse 22, the second part of it, that man is condemned to death and that they are prevented from access to the tree of life that they might eat and live forever. We see in verses 5 how the man and women desire to become like God, knowing good and evil. And we see the opposite of that in verse 22a, the first part of it. Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. We see in verses 7 through 11, the man and the woman are exposed. They're naked. And we see that in verse 21, the man and woman are clothed by God with an animal skin, which we can fairly safely say is the first sacrifice that we see in the Bible. Sin and sacrifice go hand in hand. There has to be atonement. We see in, ver in verse 12 how the man blames the woman and God indirectly. And we see the result of that accusation to where the man is cursed, the ground is cursed, he must eat by the, or work by the sweat of his brow to get food. We see in verse 13 how the woman blames the serpent and she was deceived. And we see the result of that in verse 16 where the woman is cursed. And we come to our central focal point, which is the cursing of the serpent and the promise of a Messiah, the solution to the sin problem. So we see that flaming sword and you think it's an actual sword. <clears throat> but we have from the SDA Bible commentary on this verse, light has ever been a symbol of the divine presence. As such, the Shekinah glory of God appeared between the two cherubim, one on either side of the mercy seat covering the Ark of the Covenant and the holy, in the Holy of Holies. The phrase, a flaming sword, is a rather inexact translation of the Hebrew, which reads, reads literally a glittering of the sword. There was no literal sword guarding the gate of paradise. There was rather that appeared to be the, um, the uh, scintillating reflection of light from a sword turned every way with great Rapidity, flashing shafts of light radiating from an intensely brilliant center. Furthermore, the form of the Hebrew verb methapaketh, rendered in the King James Version, turned every way, really means turning itself every way. This verb form is used exclusively to express intensive, reflexive action and requires in this instance the conclusion that the sword appeared to whirl itself about. This radiant living light was none other than the Shekinah glory, the manifestation of the divine presence. Before it, for centuries, those loyal to God gathered to worship him. So we see where man failed in stewardship of the garden, where God takes over and it's a done deal. 
And it's kind of ironic, we see the Shekinah glory and the cherubim on the mercy seat, but we also see them on the entrance to the Garden of Eden. It's nice to know, though, if man fails, God's word is sure and true. He guarded the tree of life, he kept everyone out, and we are still acknowledging that today. Adam and Eve desired to live forever, but they encountered death. And their desire to be like God, they became the tempter. Or they came, the poetry aspect of Genesis 3 does a play on words. The Hebrew word for naked is aram, and the serpent is described as cunning, aram. The play on words denotes that Adam and Eve had taken on the character of their tempter. Instead of becoming like God, they became like the one who wanted to be God. That is Satan, hence the carnal flesh we have today. Thank God we have a loving God who saves and redeems us. And on that note, Elisa, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, the serpent? Yes, the serpent. So the lesson starts with the question, who is a serpent and how does he deceive Eve. So we, we learn from the introduction that the serpent is the devil and Satan. But we want to explore that with more depth uh, to really understand who this being is. So there's a few verses that we want to start with. And uh, Genesis 3.1 we'll begin with. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So we, we see that there is this being that is interacting with the woman and um, starts by asking a question. So then in 2 Corinthians 11.3, we read, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be, cor should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So the writer then of, of Corinthians is concerned that, you know, the, the serpent who tricked Eve, you know, through his subtlety, could do the same to the new believers of the, of the Christian church in that first century, as well as he does today. So this is something to watch out for. Um, because uh, the, his tactics are not necessarily overt, um, but rather uh, covert, and uh, we need to be aware. So in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, it states, And there was war in heaven. Michael, who is Jesus, and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So we see that this being, who is known as the dragon, originated in heaven and, and not on earth. So that's an interesting point that we'll explore here. And then it goes on to say, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the serpent is identified as a definitive being. It's, he's not a mythological or symbolic being or character. The Bible is clear. The serpent is a real being and is the deceiver and the instigator of all evil. As a consequence of the serpent's deception that led to the fall of Eve, Eve and then Adam, we see God directly addressing the serpent and foretelling his fate in Genesis 3. We'll read more about that on Wednesday's lesson. But the point is that the serpent is real. He's a real being, as real as the humans he deceived. As we read in Revelation 12, the serpent is also called the devil and Satan, and is the being who first practiced his deceit in heaven and was cast to the earth. In Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19, we, we see further revelation about who this being is and who he was in heaven before his fall, what led to his fall, and how he is now the enemy of God and God's people. 
and also then what ultimately will be his fate. So let's read that together. Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in the Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and the gold. Thy workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity is found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as a profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. And then in Isaiah 27, 1, we read also about the final fate of the serpent. And it says, In that day the Lord, with his sore and great strong sword, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he, the Lord, shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So in summary, before he became the serpent and the enemy of God, Lucifer was one of the highest of the created beings, a covering cherub. From the description of the most holy place in the sanctuary, we know that there are two covering cherub that guard the law of God. We learn from Ezekiel that Lucifer was an exceedingly beautiful angel with magnificent talents in music, and he served in the royal courts of heaven. Satan allowed love of self and self-interest to usurp love and devotion to God, his creator. It was the nurturing and promotion of his self-interest that led to his open rebellion against God and his expulsion from heaven, along with the angels he deceived and who had sympathized with his cause. From that time forward, he has been the serpent, or the devil, and Satan, the enemy of God and God's people. In Patriarchs and Prophets, we read, In order to accomplish his work unperceived, Satan chose to employ as his medium the serpent, a disguise well adopted for his purpose of deception. The serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful creatures on the earth. It had wings, and while flying through the air, presented an appearance of dazzling brightness, having the color of brilliancy of burnished gold. The Bible calls a serpent subtle, and indeed he is. He uses cunning and subtleties to, to deceive, so that his victims will fall for his lies. Rather than outrightly opposing what God says, he asks Eve a question and engages her in conversation, and then just twists the truth a bit. After over 6,000 years of practice, Satan still uses this tactic today and very successfully. How critically important it is for us to know the Word of God and humbly submit to His will every day. It is only through the power of God that we can avoid the devil's deceptions tra and traps and overcome sin. So one, one final thought on this. 
So given the situation, what is our best defense against Satan's deceptions? Well, we read in Ephesians 6.11, says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I'm going to pass that over to Scott Amen. now for Monday. Thank you. I yes. can't wait to hear about the forbidden fruit. The forbidden fruit. Yes. Um, so the forbidden fruit is a symbol of an object of desire or lust. And so um, the lesson begins with asking us to compare Genesis 2, 16 and 17 and Genesis 3, 1 to 6. So I'll go ahead and read those verses. And Genesis 2, 16 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat um, of it you shall surely die. And then I, I thought I would bring one of the footnotes here, which says, uh, Dying you shall die. So, um, that seems to imply that this death was not going to be a sudden death um, upon eating the fruit, in which we'll come back around to that point. And then we're going to compare it to um, Genesis 3, 1 to 6. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the garden, but not of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. Um, and God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows in the days you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and there was a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate it. She also gave to her husband uh, with her, and he ate. So the, the part is interesting here in verse 6 is that she saw that it was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was a tree desirable to make one wise. So it seemed like a threefold temptation. The appetite, the, so the lust of uh, the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and um, the desire to basically be exalted, like to be wise like God. Um, but one of the interesting things is that um, the parallelism of having a tree of life um, might imply that there should be that the other tree should be called the tree of death. Um, taking this thought a bit further, Moses placed a brass serpent on a cross so that looking at the symbol of death, that is the serpent on the cross, um, people might live. So there, there was no ability of this brass serpent to cure people from snake bites, just like the tree of death, aka the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not in itself poisonous, and eating its fruit would not bring direct death immediately as a physical consequence of eating the fruit. Yet here is a lesson too, which is that God is more concerned with the motivation of the actions um, rather than the action itself. Uh, while Machiavelli said that the end justifies the means, God clearly revealed in his word that our duty is to do the right thing and it's God's duty to control the results. For example, when God commanded the people of Israel to march around Jericho once each day and seven times on the seventh day, um, I don't think anyone really believes that the marching around the city or the blowing of trumpets had ac actually anything to do with um, the city walls coming down. I mean, if that were a good technique, it would have been repeated afterwards by people, but I think it was merely uh, an example of showing faith in God's commandments rather than uh, the actual um, way the city was brought down. Just like in the time of uh, Naaman the leper, I don't think uh, bathing in the river without the blessing of God would have actually cured him of leprosy. Um, so I think it is in this way that God uses things as a test 
rather than telling you about the object itself. Um, so let's go back to the lesson a little bit. It says, note the parallels between God's conversation with Adam uh, and Eve and the conversation with the serpent. It is as if the serpent has now replaced God and knows even better than he does. At first he merely asked a question implying that the woman had perhaps misunderstood God. But Satan then openly questions God's intentions and even contradicts him. Satan's attack concerns two issues, um, that of death and that of the knowledge of good and evil. While God clearly and emphatically stated that their death would be certain, Satan said that on the contrary they wouldn't die, stating that humans were immortal. While God forbade Adam to eat the fruit, Satan encouraged them to eat the fruit because by eating of it they would be like God. Satan's two arguments, that of immortality and being like God, convinced Eve to eat the fruit. And it is troubling that as soon as the woman decided to disobey God and eat the forbidden fruit, she behaved as if God were no longer present um, and had been replaced by herself. Um, the biblical text alludes to the shift of personality. And, and by the way, I just wanted to make a parallel of that I think the um, nearly all false religions imply uh, replacing God and making either an idol or yourself the object of worship. So I think, for example, in the idea of pantheism, it's basically an idea of worshiping um, God in nature so that every flower, every tree is part of God. And while in a sense God is omnipresent, he is not the flower, he's not the tree, he has a, a, a personal, he's a personal being. Okay. Um, and so the other part that I was going to point out is that by attempting to uh, gain immortality, and a higher state of being that is to be like God. In fact, it had the opposite. So by eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil or the tree of death, uh, death was brought into the human family rather than eternal life. Um, and also by trying to be like God and that is uh, disobeying God, they actually, man lost his dominion and it was given, it was essentially stolen by, um, by the serpent, which is a symbol of Satan. Yeah, by um, Adam's new master. By Adam's new master, right, the serpent. Um, and then I wanted to read some quotes from uh, patriarchs and prophets, because I think there, there were some really uh, good things to say in chapter 3. Uh, it was by disobedience to the just commandments of God that Satan and his host had fallen. How important then that Adam and Eve should honor the law by which alone it was possible for order and equity to be maintained. The law of God is as sacred as himself. It is a revelation of his will, a transcript of his character, the expression of divine love and wisdom. The harmony of creation depends upon the perfect conformity of all beings, of everything, animate and inanimate, to the law of the creator. God ordained laws for the government, not only of living beings, but of all the operations of na nature. Everything is under fixed laws, which cannot be disregarded, which I'm thinking is a good thing. So if you drop a ball, it falls to the ground. It doesn't just float in the air like you do in outer space. 9.8 9 meters per second. That's consistently. true. Consistently. Yes. Um, but everything in nature is um, governed by natural law. Man alone, of all the inhabitants of the earth, is amenable to moral law. To man, the crowning work of creation, God has given the power to understand his requirements, to comprehend uh, the justice and beneficence of his law, and its sacred claims upon him, and of man's unswerving obedience is required. The, tree of knowledge has been made a test of their obedience and their love to God. The Lord had seen fit to lay upon them but one prohibition as to the use of all that was in the garden. But if they should disregard his will in this particular, 
they would incur the guilt of trans, um, transgression. Satan was not only to follow them with continual temptations, uh, but he could have access to them at the forbidden tree only. <coughs> Should they investigate its nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. They were admonished um, to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them and to be content with the instructions he had seen fit to impart. The fruit was very beautiful and she questioned with herself why God had withheld it from them. Now was the tempter's opportunity. Um, Yea, hath God really said, um, you shall not eat of every tree? Eve was surprised and startled as she thus seemed to hear the echo of her thoughts. Um, in the interest of time, I think maybe I will, I will skip ahead a little bit. So, such has been Satan's work from the days of Adam to the present, and he has pursued it with great success. He tempts men to distrust God's love and to doubt his wisdom. He is constantly seeking to excite a spirit of irreverent curiosity, a restless, inquisitive desire to penetrate the secrets of divine wisdom and power. In their efforts to search out what God has been pleased to withhold, multitudes overlook the truths which he has revealed and which are essential to, to salvation. Satan tempts men to disobedience by leading them to believe that they are entering a wonderful field of knowledge. But this is all a deception. Elated with their ideas of progression, they are, by trampling on God's requirements, setting their feet on a path that leads to degradation and death. Wow. We'll stop there. I think I have more to say, but we'll, <laughs> we'll yeah, so continue. Basically, though, yeah, he, she was deceived, but she knew what she was doing. But still, the subtlety, it deceived a third of the angels. Well, the, the other her. part that says in one of these other uh, um, paragraphs is basically that the fact that Eve really believed Satan didn't save her from the consequence. Because the, the problem was not that she was deceived by Satan, but that she distrusted God. So I right. think... The most important point of this is that we have to trust God at his word if we, if, even if we don't understand Or why. even if it doesn't make sense. Right. It didn't make sense to her. Why, why should this beautiful fruit um, not be allowed to eat? And Satan pointed out to them, hey, it's not really poisonous. Look, I'm eating it. It's fine. Well, and it does say that in Patriarchs and Prophets, which is an excellent segue into Tuesday and the result of that breaking of the law. Hiding before God. So we're going to read Genesis 3, verses 7 through 13. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you, whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. The Lord said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Are both partially true? Sure. In verse 7, we see the results of eating the forbidden fruit. Their eyes were certainly opened. Did they have clothes before? Technically, by we look at it? Right, no, the, yeah, the, even in the beginning, I think it's chapter one, it says they were naked, but they didn't know. And Ellen White writes in Christ's Object Lessons, page 310, the white robe of innocence was worn by our first parents when they were placed by God in holy Eden. They lived in perfect conformity to the will of God. 
all the strength of their affections was given to their heavenly father. A beautiful, soft light, the light of God, enshrouded the holy pair. This robe of light was a symbol of their spiritual garments of heavenly innocence. They had remained... Had they remained true to God, it would, ha it would ever have continued to enshroud them. But when sin entered, they severed their connection with God, and the light that had encircled them departed. Naked and ashamed, they tried to supply the place of the heavenly garment by sewing together fig leaves for a covering. So let's talk about this word made. They wanted to be like... Be that the saints have a halo? A uh, symbol of like a, of a, the covering of light? Well, it's and supposed some... to be the whole body, just not the head. But they kind of get that from the throne of God. And actually, it's kind of a man adaptation. So, but, um, so let's talk about um, this word made. We read in Genesis 2, 3, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And we see the same word in Genesis 3, 7. In Hebrew, it's esot. Pardon my pronunciation. It's implied in the writing that Adam and Eve were attempting to make as God did. And it's a play on words. So how they do? Sewing those fig leaves together. Not even a, really a comparison. So we look at John 15, 5. When Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We are truly helpless without God in our lives. At least there's nothing good that comes from us. So after knowing good and evil... Man saw his true condition, knew his sin. So let me ask you, what does sin do to our relationship with God? Separates us. Separates us, and we definitely keep our distance, right? We try to. And so they hid. How, here we see how wide the gap between God and man was. It took the Savior of of. Genesis 3.15 to, to bridge that gap. And when did that happen? At the cross. But it was the promise of it back in Genesis 15 that they clung to. Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, so are much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. With that big of a gap, we know why they hid. So when God calls out to the man, does he know where he is? Mm -hmm. Of course he does. Because Psalms 139 verses 7 through 10 say, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. We know that God is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. He's ever-present, all-powerful, and all-knowing. We can never escape from God. God knows where Adam and Eve are. He, it were. He knows where we are every moment of our life. Even when we run from him, he is always waiting for us to call upon him. The God who knows your thoughts even before you have them, knows your physical, mental, and spiritual state 24-7. Today, we must learn even in our nakedness, to come to God just as we are, to not make the mistake that Adam and Eve made. So now we see the future con or further consequences of sin. We see the blame game. We never do that, huh? At, f at the first phase of judgment occurs here. The investigation begins. First, God asked the man, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? 
So Adam blames the woman, right? The woman gave it to me. But he also blames God. Because he said, not only does he blame the woman, the one that he loves so much, but he actually accuses or says, the woman that you gave me, God, so you gave me this instrument that led me to sin. Oh boy, that's heavy-handed, isn't it? How often do we in the world today own up to what we've done? Or do we try and run from, away from our sin? How hard is it sometimes to, to acknowledge that sin and repent? So we see that with Adam. Next we go to Eve. as She's next in the questioning, the interrogation. What is this, uh, what is this you have done? And the claims that the serpent deceived her, did he? Kind of. And we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, she sees the serpent in the tree, and he's eating the fruit, and she gets it in her head that somehow might, God might be wrong. But nonetheless, did she outright defy God? And the answer is yes. We will see this judgment carried out in this investigation in verses 16 through 19. Because so remember, judgment has three phases. First, there's the questioning, the gathering of the facts. Second is the verdict, and they are guilty. And third is the execution of that judgment or verdict, which for us, here and now and today, is either eternal life, ultimately, when probation does close, or eternal death. On that note, oh boy, Elisa, can you tell us about the fate of the serpent? Yes, indeed. It's, so following Adam and Eve's fall into sin, what did the Lord say to the serpent, and how did that give hope to the pair and to us today? Let's read Genesis 3.15 again. And it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In this one sentence, which is less than 30 words, the Lord prophetically pronounces the relationship that will exist between good and evil from that time forward, and what ultimately will be the fate of the serpent and of evil itself. This prophecy is an essential element to understanding the plan of salvation and the struggle between the dragon, the woman, and the child in Revelation 12. There are four main points discussed in this text. First of all, there's enmity. The translation of that original Hebrew is hatred or war. Webster's Dictionary describes enmity as mutual hatred or ill will. The enmity discussed here is a severe clash of ideologies, leading to a direct conflict or warfare. There's no room for tolerance and acceptance between the parties. The second point here is that the enmity is between the serpent and the woman. We understand from Sunday's lesson, from Ezekiel 28, that the serpent is the devil and Satan. A woman in Bible prophecy represents the church, and this woman is God's true church. The third point here is that the enmity is also between the serpent seed and the woman seed. In other words, the offspring of Satan and the offspring of the woman. This is enmity between the wicked people who align to Satan's way and those who believe and follow God. Some examples from the Bible in regards to a description of Satan's offspring. We read in John 8, 44, when Jesus was speaking to the Jewish rulers. He said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh from his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Conversely, if we um, look at a text that discusses the woman's offspring or the Lord's offspring, Christ's true believers, in Revelation 14:12, it reads, Here is the patience of the saints. 
Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And then the fourth point that we read in Genesis 3.15 is that the enmity was be also going to be between the woman's seed and the serpent. This last point foretells that the seed would mortally wound the serpent. This is a promise of the coming Messiah that would put an end to the serpent and to evil itself. In Genesis 3, we find the Lord pronouncing judgment on the guilty parties. He begins with the serpent, who is the instigator of this terrible event, and who receives a fatal curse as a result. The lesson points out that there is a type of reversal of creation as a result of sin. Creation had led to life, appreciation of good and blessings, while sin led to death, evil, and curses. Yet God left Adam and Eve and us with hope, a hope of salvation and restoration that would come through the woman's seed, or the Messiah. That hope is in Christ. This promise of hope was given to Adam and Eve before God pronounced the consequences they would face as a result of their sin. Let's compare this with a few other texts to discuss how the plan of salvation and the great controversy between good and evil overall is revealed in the Bible. In Romans 16.20, we read, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The translation of the Greek word for bruise in this text means to break in pieces, to tread down, to conquer or trample, and to break down and crush. This text reveals that God will destroy Satan under the feet of his saints, and that would happen in the near future. We know that the final destruction of Satan will occur at the second death, and you can read about that in Revelation 19 and 20. Let's now take a look at Hebrews 2, 14. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. In this text, we learn that God became flesh so that through his death he could overcome death and the devil who had the power of death. God, who is the self-existent and eternal one, had to take on human nature so that he could be subject to death, the death that we deserve because of our sin. He paid the penalty through his own death. This is the promise foretold in Genesis 3.15, that the woman's seed would bruise the serpent's head. And then in Revelation 12.17, we read that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. This text provides further detail about the enmity between the woman, or God's church, and the dragon, or Satan, and also between the woman's offspring and Satan. We learn that the distinguishing characteristic of the woman's offspring is that they keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. The Bible reveals that the conflict between good and evil and against God's true worshipers will be severe and last until Christ comes again. However, we also have the promise, first spoken in Genesis 3.15, that Satan and evil itself will be defeated and destroyed. And then with a final thought, in Revelation 20.10, it reveals further the detail of Satan's demise, and it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. Hand off to Thursday. Oh, I love that, though, because really Satan, the serpent, received that deadly blow at the cross. 
Because in John 16, 11, it says, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. That's when yes. Christ took it back. But you're right, the final the final, The final destruction does, and demise and the end of right. evil itself won't happen until Christ comes again. Right, and actually even at the second death when he's finally yeah. completely gone, and we'll see yeah. the new earth and the new heaven. Yes. Scott, can you tell us about human destiny? Human destiny. So this is kind of the execution part of the judgment here. So in Genesis 3:15 through 24, it says, um, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will gl greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain uh, you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam has said, Because you heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, curse it as the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it, and both, and all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field, in the sweat of your face shall you eat your bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So, it's interesting here, and I think it comments in, in, the, um, in the lesson, that instead of directly placing the curse on man and woman, uh, instead God is placing the curse on the serpent and on the ground. And through the serpent, he is um, punishing the woman, and through the curse on the ground, he's punishing the man. Uh, but yet also through, through the, um, the seed of the woman, which we know is Christ, all of that gets to be undone. So um, let's finish reading the verses here. Um, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Uh, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man hath become like one of us to know good and evil. And now let us put out his hand, um, and now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed the cherubim at the east of the garden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So the, the third part of the punishment here seems like it was the loss of access to their garden home and the tree of life, uh, without which they couldn't live forever. But we'll realize that that in itself was um, a blessing because man in his fallen condition would have... Um, not, let, let's just say if we had evil people still alive today, that would not be a blessing to the rest of the world. So God has to prove the people who, um, who will uh, be worthy of eternal life. Um, all right. Um, then the, the lesson also brings out uh, the part about um, 1 Timothy 2, 14 and 15, and it says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Uh, so through the literal woman, that is Eve, Satan brought death upon the earth, but Christ, who would be born of the woman, would bring life and immortality. So thus, uh, the, the same instrument that is the woman who brought death into the world would also bring salvation into the world. So Christ was able to turn it around. Uh, he was the seed of the woman who, was, who would be able to, um, uh, to redeem man from his, uh, from his lost condition. And another point to make out of this is that... Um, the way that Eve fell is by 
lusting that is using her her emotional part of the brain that is the croc brain which would be in the amygdala uh, but Adam was able to reason through this by using his frontal lobe or his neocortex thus uh, I believe this scene will be repeated again in the final scenes of Earth's history is that people will be allured to follow their emotional appeals of the um, the emotional uh, revivals that are brought forth and I think there's a chapter in Great Controversy that talks about the emotional revivals that are going to be common and they're already common is that people are required or, or they're invited to to have this emotional high and thus Satan can bring in his deceptions uh, when people are using their emotional reasoning rather than their brain um, okay let's see what else Eve uh, and this is a quote from patriarchs and prophets now um, Eve was told of the sorrow and pain that must henceforth be her portion and the Lord said thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee in the creation God made her the equal of Adam Adam had they remained obedient to God in harmony with this great law of love they would ever have been in harmony with each other but sin had brought discord and now their union could be maintained and harmony be preserved only by submission on the part of one or the other Eve had been been the first in transgression and she had fallen into temptation by separating from her companion contrary to the divine direction it was by her solicitation that Adam had sinned and she was now placed in subjection to her husband had the principles enjoined in the law of God been cherished by the fallen race this sentence though growing out of the result of sin would have pro proven to be a blessing to them but man's abuse of the supremacy thus given to him was has too often rendered the lot of women very bitter and made her life a burden so Eve had been perfectly happy by her husband's side in her Eden home but like restless modern Eve she was flattered with the hope of uh, um, she was flattered let me see with the hope of entering a higher sphere than that which God had assigned her in attempting to rise above her original position she fell far below it a similar result will be reached by all who are unwilling to take up cheerfully their life duties in accordance with God's plan in their efforts to reach positions for which he has not fitted them many are leaving vacant uh, the place where they might be a blessing in their desire for a higher sphere many have sacrificed true womanly dignity and nobility of character and have left undone the very work that heaven appointed so and then um, even though women uh, became subject unto man as a result of sin if done according to the will of God this could have um, been a blessing however um, it, it, Paul also says in the New Testament that um, man should exemplify Christ so even as uh, Christ is the head of the church so thus man needs to be self-sacrificing as Christ, Christ was uh, in contrast to this the modern concept that women are liberated from their responsibility to the family and to her man has in most cases made uh, women more miserable rather than better off um, in, in the work that I do I frequently see the results of these broken families and the woe it causes upon all the parties especially the children it is often the case that the step parent is not as loving um, as their biological parents and uh, during the time of Zedekiah that is the last king of Judah um, before the Messiah the Jews had had they submitted to Babylon they might have saved themselves from the complete destruction that was brought upon them uh, but I didn't want to let the man get away so even though I'm short on time I'll have to uh, talk about man's curse it says to Adam the Lord declared 
Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thou, thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Um, and then I'm going to skip ahead because we already read the verse. Under the curse of sin, all nature was to witness to man of the character and results of rebellion against God. So when God made him to rule over the earth and all the living creatures, so long as Adam remained loyal to heaven, all nature was in subjection to him. But when he rebelled against the divine law, the inferior creatures were in rebellion against his rule. Thus, the Lord in his great mercy would show men that uh, the results of the, uh, the sacredness of his law and lead them by their own experience to see the danger of setting it aside, even in the slightest degree. And the life of toil which was henceforth um, to be man's lot, was appointed in love. It was a discipline rendered needful by sin to place a check upon the indulgence of appetite and passion and to develop habits of self-control. It was part of God's great plan of man's recovery from the ruin and degradation of sin. Thus, it is that even God's curses can be made into blessing if we submit to them rather than view them as unfair and arbitrary, as did Cain, by the way. So, anyway, with that, we'll move on to the, well, I guess it's at the end, so the we'll final move thoughts. on to the conclusion. So, Elisa, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, the, the final thoughts. So, you know, we, we read in Genesis 3 how, you know, quickly after the fall and sin, God goes looking for man. And, and indeed, we see that principle around expediency and urgency in how God shows mercy and forgiveness to a truly repentant person. Um, and so, you know, there's nothing we can do to appease or, or earn our, or in favor of God, like, like is often taught in other religions. Um, God, is, God is liberally merciful and, and must be because it was his law that had been trampled on. So we can rest assured that God's plan for salvation and his mercy, it weighs heavily in the favor of God's saints. And um, he made ample provision for salvation and for restoration with him. And so we can take hope in that. Amen. Scott touched on in Patriarchs and Prophets in chapter 3 how Eve was deceived by the serpent. It accounts how the serpent was on the tree of knowledge, and we know of good and evil, eating the fruit that would kill you. And all this did was reinforce the doubts that she already had going through her mind. But let us remember in the lesson today, this is one of two points I want to stress. No matter how something may look, how it may seem right or correct, we must always remember that God's word is eternal and unchangeable. Sometimes we just have to trust in God. Seeing the serpent eat the food, oh, it's not going to kill me. Yes, it will. Sometimes we, well, actually all the time, we need to trust and have faith that God has our best interest in for us. And even Matthew 24, 24 expresses this. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. If we don't know God's word, if we don't know what it says and, and what he expects from us, we can be deceived to the sin that Eve was, which will get us kicked out of Eden as well, permanently. Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets also writes, Adam understood that his companion had transgressed the command of God, disregarded the only prohibition laid upon them as a test of their fidelity and love. There was a terrible struggle in his mind. He mourned that he had permitted Eve to wander from his side. That would be that caretaker in the beginning, right? Um, but now the deed was done. He must be separated from her whose society had been his joy. How could he have it thus? 
Adam had enjoyed the companionship of God and of holy angels. He had looked upon the glory of the Creator. He understood the high destiny open to the human race should they remain faithful to God. Yet all these blessings were lost sight of in the fear of losing that one gift which in his eyes outvalued every other. Love, gratitude, loyalty to the Creator, all were overborne by love to Eve. Let me ask this, have you ever done what was wrong in God's eyes because of a friend, a boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe your spouse, or your children, or your parents? You get the picture, right? Have you ever bended God's rules just to please that person? Luke 14, 26 clearly says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Simply put, if God is not first, he's last in our lives. And we can't be with him. And for in this life or, or all eternity until we put him first in every thought. So I pray that each one of us here tonight might adhere to follow God at his word. It is his very character. And that we place God first in everything. I do it myself. We are a work in progress, but that is our goal. That we might avoid the judgment of death that our first parents faced. And for us, it'll be death eternal if we do. So I pray that we all embrace God and follow his way in his well. Let us pray. Thank you, our Heavenly Father. For once our first parents fell, you were there. As Elisa said, you were there immediately. You seek to bring us home to you. You seek to restore us to what we once were. And Lord, to make us so much more someday in heaven when we get to spend all eternity with you. Guide us, Lord, that your laws may be written on our hearts. And Lord, that we may be steadfast and true to you. That we may have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Because Lord, by ourselves, it's impossible for us to do. We ask for the indwelling each and every day. That we might follow you. To be co-laborers with you on this earth. And to do your good pleasure. To be the sons and daughters of the living God here now and forevermore. And we pray all this to you, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Messiah, our Savior from Genesis 3.15. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.